Don, thanks very much for inviting me. It's great to be here at UMBC and, uh, and very pleased to be speaking to the, uh, the Brown Club of Baltimore. The, uh, very important, as uh, mentioned, I am a Brown alum, so it's, uh, it's really great, a great pleasure to be speaking to a group of other folks who are uh, associated with Brown in various ways. The, uh, can you all, everybody hear me okay? And uh, I'll look to my colleague with the video camera in the back, wants to make sure that my voice is okay, so we have a thumbs up. All right. The, uh, so uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to describe what is sometimes called brain-computer interfaces, and uh, we'll be describing uh, various technologies that we hope will one day help to restore communication and mobility to people with uh, physical disabilities. The most important disclosure, though, by far, is the great group of people that I get to work with uh, every day. At the uh, center of all this research is Professor of Neuroscience at Brown, uh, John Donahue, also the, the director of the now Institute for Brain Sciences uh, at Brown, uh, colleagues in computer science, colleagues in engineering and neurosurgery. And uh, this is uh, just a few of the people who, uh, who sit around the table uh, every week to, to think about our research and to help to move it forward. It's really, uh, truly a multidisciplinary uh, research endeavor, and that's one of the great things about it. This was an MRI of a woman who was 42 back 13, 14 years ago, uh, who had no significant past medical history, that is, she was perfectly healthy, when suddenly she couldn't move the left side of her body, and then she couldn't move the right side of her body, and then she couldn't speak. And when we look at this picture, this is a type of MRI called a diffusion-weighted image. And uh, what this shows us are the parts of the brain that have had a stroke. Uh, and in simple summary, in this slide, gray is good and white is bad. And most of what we see up there is gray, except you may notice on the left and the middle, right in the center, uh, there's a big uh, bright spot which if we, uh, we magnify a little bit, right in the middle of the brain, that's the brain stem, specifically the pons, which sits in the middle of the brain stem. And, uh, and that has had, a, uh, for that part of the brain, a very large stroke, essentially disconnecting the perfectly functioning top part of her brain from everything below it. Uh, a few days later, uh, she was awake and alert, understanding everything that was being said to her, but she was unable to move and unable to speak. And it's for people like her and for other people with similar or perhaps not as severe disabilities that we're all hoping that we can develop technologies that will restore the ability to turn thought back into action. So why do we need uh, these devices? Why brain-computer interfaces or any of these neural interfaces? Well, there are many diseases that can leave somebody with an impaired, significantly impaired mobility, uh, but still awake and alert and, uh, and, and wishing to fully interact as they had before. And some of those are listed uh, on the left, stroke ALS, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Locked-in syndrome, the state that, of that woman whose MRI I described a moment ago uh, is, is sometimes referred to as being locked in, that is fully aware of everything going on around her, but unable to communicate uh, with the outside and unable to move. Uh, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, and the others that are, that are listed there, all uh, situations, injuries, or diseases that the ability to control one's environment uh, is, is impaired as a result of the injury or disease. Uh, conservatively estimated, there are hundreds of thousands of people worldwide uh, with, uh, with these diseases or disorders, and the assistive technology that we have available today is, uh, is really quite limited. Uh, in cartoon form, the, the desire to move, as we all know here, begins in the brain, uh, and that thought process, that intention to move, uh, finds its way through a pathway somewhat more complicated than the one listed there. Uh, from the top of the brain, from the cortex down into the brain stem and the spinal cord, uh, usually to engage movement. But for any number of these reasons, uh, the movement may become impaired, any of the reasons listed on the left. And our goal, while there's lots of research very well focused on trying to repair that injury represented by the red X, our goal is to try to create a new pathway to take that intention to move and create a new pathway for it to enable movement. For the woman who I uh, described who's unable to move and unable to speak, if we could restore the ability to type or to browse the web for entertainment or education, uh, to use a text-to-speech application, all those would be extremely helpful in, uh, in improving her quality of life. For somebody like the gentleman whose video you saw, uh, who is able to speak, and you'll, uh, you'll uh, see him speaking in just a little while, uh, but who's paralyzed, who's tetraplegic, that is unable to move his arms or his legs, if we could uh, improve his ability to control a powered wheelchair, maybe to control semi-autonomous robots to help with his activities of daily living, uh, all of those would be helpful. 
Uh, for people who, are, uh, who have lost limbs, whether the result of trauma or vascular disease, there are some really superb prosthetic limbs that are now being developed. Uh, but what we don't yet have is a great way to control those limbs. And if we could take this signal out of the brain, the desire to move, and convert that into the control of a very advanced prosthetic limb, then maybe we could really uh, allow somebody to get the great control that's available by these limbs, but, uh, but isn't uh, truly available because there's no controller for it yet. Uh, the dream for the research, though, is listed there at the bottom, at least for people with spinal cord injury or brainstem stroke, which is to one day reconnect brain to limb, to allow somebody to think about moving their own paralyzed hand again and for that hand to move. And that might be done by taking these brain or movement-related signals from the brain and connecting it to other technologies that are implanted in the limb that enable movement, that stimulate the nerves and muscles. So here, without any learning, without any special instructions, the moment that he tried to do something with his hand, that neuron started firing away, probably just the way that it did before he had a spinal cord injury. And it was when we saw graphs like this and we listened and we heard that activity uh, on the oscilloscopes and the amplifiers, uh, that's really what told us that we would be able to take that activity, that those cells that are still trying to do what they used to do, and to convert that activity to the control of an external device such as a computer cursor. What I'd like to do is show you a few videos of this gentleman uh, controlling a cursor uh, just by imagining the movement of his own hand. You'll hear him talking a little bit. His voice will be a little bit raspy. He's on a ventilator as he's doing it, but he's going to describe to some extent what it is that he's doing. Okay, so here's the CyberKinetics desktop. What do you want to do first? I'm going to open my email first. Okay. So this is a simulated email program. You can open the first one. And it says, congratulations, you are doing a great job. And that Good. cursor that you see is what we call the neural cursor. Sorry. He's moving that cursor by imagining okay. or attempting to move his own hand. It says, hi, we'll talk soon. Great. Now can you exit back to the CyberKinetics I desktop? I want to exit. You can exit. I'll show you some other examples of control of virtual or computer-based devices, but one of our hopes uh, is that we can get control over physical devices, and particularly prosthetic limbs uh, for people who've lost their limbs, as I mentioned, due to either trauma or vascular disease. Uh, one of the uh, reasons, one of the goals uh, of our uh, Department of Veterans Affairs support is to see if we can help develop a technology that will allow better brain control over the great prosthetic limbs that are now being developed. So uh, you can see just a little bit, you can see the, the hands just on the left of this lower screen of our participant in the trial. What he's looking at is a real prosthetic hand that's used for people with, uh, with for distal amputation. That hand is facing him, and you're going to hear him say open and close uh, just so that we know what it is that he's thinking or, or trying to do. And depending on how the audio is in here, you may hear his initial response to his uh, ability to do this. You see her sitting in the chair. She's thinking about the movement of her own hand as though she was uh, controlling the joystick of a powered wheelchair. We'll zoom in on that technology in, uh, in just a moment called Roll Talk, uh, which is a nice assistive technology that comes out of Norway, very uh, easily programmable, and, and we can work with that very nicely. And her job is to get that wheelchair over towards the door uh, in between the two chairs, the two obstacles, basically, that, uh, that are in her way. So we'll zoom in, uh, see four buttons, up, down, right, left, and then stop. Every time she stops the chair, it rolls back just a little bit. Get a quick view of her hand, which is in this chronic uh, upward or supinated position. Go right up to it and then stop. That's John Donahue's Fantastic. voice in the background. Fantastic. Very good. <laughs> so... Uh, she was happy, the research team is happy. I hope that the research will, uh, will continue and uh, that I can come back in a few years and uh, show you some additional advances. And uh, thank you very much for your time.